Hey, welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with it's the interview series presented by WFPK and WFPK.org consequence and the consequence podcast network. Thanks as always for making your way here for checking out the series. Of course, you know what to do. If you like what you see, what you hear hit that subscribe button, I put out three new interviews every single week. So it's a great way to keep up with all of your favorite artists. And I am so excited to have one of my songwriting heroes on here today. Dave Wakeling of the English beat. Hello. Hey, Carl, how are you? Three interviews a week. So you must see patterns. You see patterns in uh, the way people respond, the way people perhaps avoid. I wonder if you found any current themes that run through, apart from the glaring narcissism that we all share. Um, the only thing worse than being a narcissist pop writer is a journalist who follows them around. That's really weird. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, you know, have you found any common threads with doing that um, many interviews? It's, in it's interesting. They're the obvious ones. Like, uh, you know, some people do want to talk about AI these days, and that's been going on for the past year. Uh, right. Although that's sort of to tail off a bit. But uh, I find the most interesting theme that a lot of musicians are talking about, because I also talk with film and, you know, and TV. Actually, I see. Yep. Um, but the musicians is, um, broadly, I'll say, space in the universe. And it's, I, you know, I've got my own theories on this, because, you know, uh, it's a form of escapism and it's isolation. So as right. we have lots of things going on in the world, there's, you know, sort of that, how far away can I get from here? But, you know, and, and not just post pandemic, but just sort of this, you know, isolated digital world that we find ourselves anyway. I, I, I think there's a, a lot of that that go hand in hand, you know, that, uh, wow. yeah, so. how interesting. Well, that'll make a good book when you get to the end of it to, to follow those themes through oh. be nice to have something to come out of all this other than just great conversation maybe that's enough great conversation that's, it. that's all you get nice conversations and a cup of tea if you're lucky <laughs> I, had been, I mean um i mean there's the records and that we can get onto that later but i've been um i've been preparing my palate to start drinking some fine chinese teas and i've done it by going back to my british roots and i've bought about 20 of the finest tea bags from around the world, boxes of them, not just single tea bags. And I, I'm going through and I, I'm starting to prepare my top 10 of uh, British style cuppers with milk. Uh, just in order to see, I watched all these programs on the YouTube and all I can taste is tea, you know, but they go like, it's apricot. No, no, apricot pit mm -hmm. and slate. But it's wet slate early in the morning. And I'm like, all I can taste is it's tea. tea. It's all I can taste, and it's nice tea or not. So I'm, I'm building up for it. Um, at the moment, I'm awaiting a cup of uh, Master's uh, Barry's tea from uh, right. Cork in Ireland. Uh, Barry's Master Blend, which is my yeah, favorite. Right. PG tips, how are you? PG it's tips right here for me. That's what I've got going on at the end. Uh, I second. find it a little empty to start and a little bitter at the end. It's uh, See, I like I the bitter. I like the bitter. Right, you see, it depends what you tipple, doesn't it? You know, um, Thompson's from Belfast is currently running second. Their signature blend very good. But I actually find that most of the time I just prefer straight Assam tea. Mm-hmm without it being a blend of anything. That's the part of a cup of tea, which there's some of that in PG tips and they mix it with other stuff, mainly African stuff now, it used to be Chinese. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, it's a nice habit and it keeps me off the streets. And I get plenty of exercise because every two cups you have to run to the bathroom, see if you'll make it in time. <laughs> so it's a perfect diuretic, as you know. <laughs> I do know, uh, I'm, a, I'm a very, very big tea drinker and I've done Done the deep dives. Uh, PG, I'm, I'm here in Kentucky, and of course you can get any tea from anywhere. But that, that's the that's the that's the easiest to find. That's of quality that I care about. Right. And the green tea, because you have the different caffeines. I mean, you have yes. uh, black tea, and usually I'll start my day with some black tea, hit some espresso in the midday if I need to, and then green tea in the early afternoon. Oh, it's a mellow ice. Wow. Yeah. Oh, you're you're way ahead tea. of me. I'm yeah. still quaffing. Cups there. Here comes the masters, <laughs> Barry Masters, the master of blending teas. There's even a lovely uh, interview with the chief blender over there in Cork. In you know, we really... have one, we have one tea farm in America because you can't really grow it. Mississippi. 
Uh, right. it, yeah, is that right? I knew it was. Yes, in the I was trying to buy some tea from there. I've never had it. Sold out. Yeah, I've never had they're it. More or less sold out, apart from a couple of flavored types, which I'm not keen on, you know. But the, out of their regular blends, they had about six types going, but they were all sold out when I looked last week. I thought that would be nice. I, I bought two tea plants. They're only small, uh -huh. but they reckon that you can start picking on them in a year or two. I bought an Assam and a Darjeeling, and I bought a book on how to dry them yourself. So, That's nice, wait. though. You know, some people lovely? made sourdough bread during the uh, <laughs> pandemic, yeah. and uh, you know we've all got our hobbies. Uh, you let me know how that goes. I've never, uh, I've never grown one. I'll be, I'll be interested yeah. to hear how that goes later on. I will. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know whether it's just going to be purely decorative, and I look at it whilst I drink somebody <laughs> else's tea. But <laughs> there's always the promise of it, isn't it? You know, I think it'd be nice. It's terribly hot here, of course, in California in the summer, uh, 108, 120. Uh, the garden's really off bounds for three months or so of the year, which is a shame. Even the swimming pool's dangerous. You get the back of your head burnt, you know. So um, I built a, a kind of tent, a sunscreen tent, and I managed to get away with a few plants that can't take the full desert sun. Uh, and that's where I hide in the summer. Yeah. Uh, and that's going to be my tea garden with, <laughs> with the tea You trees. know, some people grow weed in the basement and some people have the tea garden in the... Uh... Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit of music. Um, yeah. I do love that this has turned into a tea podcast today. I really do. This is uh, unexpected uh, and a pleasure, a delight. But we got... Uh, you got So the English Beat uh, just did the reissues. Uh, I Just Can't Stop is already out. What Happened is on its way on Record Store Day this year. Yes. Yeah, and... Uh, Rhino have done a terrific job... Uh, and they, I did say when I f first met them that I thought that Shout Factory had done an impeccable job. And he confidently said, uh, oh, you wait till you watch Rhino. And I said, I'm watching now. But i got to say, both releases not only look great, but they sound great as well. Uh, which is, uh, That sounds a bit odd to say that, like, wow. But the, their attention to detail has been... Uh, very effective, I will say that. So you hold the record, it feels great in your hand, it looks great. It's presented uh, like it's a great record, which is a nice feeling. And, and even better than that with Rhino, it's presented around and at the same time as other great records as well that are also presented so nicely. So it does make you feel like you're in a, a special little club, really, of the impeccable releases <laughs> team. I mean, we're so talking about. Nice we are talking about some of the greatest albums of all time, and you all were, you know, in, in creating those, and I, I mean that. But and to get to to get excited, by the way, about anything that you've been dealing with for forty years, to find new things to get excited about, like that says something. Stunning, really, yes, because uh, there've been a number of releases, and they, most of them have sort of been okay. Some of them have been a bit dire, really. Uh, you can tell the difference when somebody releases, re-releases a record, whether there was anybody in the building who heard it the first time round or not. Uh, that's an arbiter. Uh, uh, Shout Factory had, had really taken it up a notch, and, and now Rhino, it, it looks fantastic. Uh, and uh, it sounds better. Their remastering sounds better. I know that uh, mastering has become a real... Well, it's boomed, hasn't it? The, the opportunities for what you can do. Somebody told me that you can pick the sound of your favourite album and you can go in and tell them, master the album to that EQ then. And they can re-EQ your masters to make it sound like the Prince record without the Prince bit. But the sonic field that it exists in you can press a button and you can have your record sound like Dark Side of the Moon. It's remarkable. I mean, I'm not it? surprised in that, but that that is remarkable. And and, mm. and would just that would be tempting. That would be tempting. Like, yeah, just right. Do all those things. I just want to hear it. It's. it's uh... <laughs> I'd end up being like completely conflicted. And no, I want tracks one, six, and seven like Dark Side of the Moon. But track four's got to be Sergeant Pepper's. Dave, it'll never work. Trust me on this. I'm an artist. God damn it. <laughs> an artist. <laughs> then I'd go to bed not feeling well and the album would never come out. <laughs> <laughs>
So, you know, after 40 years, and you sing these, you sing these every show. I do. Do you find, do you find that you can still connect with them in the same way? Well, yes, and sadly, because too many of them are still pertinent. Uh, they were meant to be written as warnings, precautions. Watch out, kids, else this is going to happen. And now it's happened. And uh, I suppose the nicest and the saddest compliment is people come up to me after the show and go, cool, blimey, Dave, those could have been written about today. And I'm like, oh, well, that was the fear. Um, so, so it is easy to connect, but it's, it's not always that satisfying. Uh, you have to say, uh, the hippie generation and the punk generation uh, very cleverly thought we were going to do a lot better than our mums and dads who had only just about managed to stagger out of World War II with PTSD till they dropped. Uh, and sadly, that doesn't seem to be the case at all. All our good ideas, all our extra curricular activities, all our extra access to information the world's in a worse state than when our parents left us uh, and that's a bit despondent isn't it you know we get into that phase where you, you feel like an innate need to apologize to the younger generations and like, i'm really sorry this is not what we intended and we've left you within an almost impossible situation now and that's not a great feeling uh and that makes it even worse that I was standing on the tops of burning buildings screaming about this 40 years ago. Watch out, kids! <laughs> but I suppose that's the way of the world, isn't it? You know, and everybody thinks the world's going to end in a, you know, in a few years. That They've been doing it forever. And they probably will be still thinking the world's just about to end in a thousand years' time. So, uh, at the same time, you do see some evolution, don't you, in the way the world is moving and turning. Uh, we get to see a lot of the carnage on the TV screens. That's what sells. But at the same time, there's more women who can read and write in the world than ever before in the history of the world. Now, the fact that that would even need to be a statistic is ridiculous. Right. But the fact that it's heading in the right direction is a, a decent statistic to, to remember. So there's stuff that is happening. There's a bit of a backlash now, but at the time when we were making these records, you had to be a bit careful, or gay people still got beat up, like, severely uh, for being a bit too gay in public or something, you know. That's a, a thing of the past, although there's a backlash, you fear that might be coming back. Uh, racism was quite a lot worse uh, in those days. It's much better now. The younger generations are doing a better job at that. So you do see all signs of uh, progress. Uh, people don't get their whole lives and careers ruined over smoking some pot anymore. Now they use it to fund police stations for whole states <laughs> and schools and stuff like the hippies said you could do in 1968. Right, right. Long-haired layabouts. And um, so there are signs of evolution, uh, but there, it does seem like the race is on. And I only bring this up because I'm sure, like me, you look at those record sleeves and you know that they changed your perception of the world mm -hmm. and you'd like to believe, as I would too, that those records changed enough people's perception of the world that the world itself could change as a, to a consequence. And if you read the front page of the newspaper, you don't see much of that going on. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to think, you know, progress never happens overnight. And yes. and, it, and there's always a pendulum, that right? That's a little push yeah. and pull. So yeah. I, I'm hopeful. And sometimes it's hard to be hopeful. And sometimes for all very big reasons <coughs> that we all see, that I get hopeful that, you know, maybe it's this. And if we go back, we're not coming back to here. We're just going back a little bit before we go forward again. Right. And that's, that's how the history of the world has played out over the past few thousand yeah. years. So well, ideally, that's how it will continue. But, um, yeah. but luckily, 
you also do it in a very catchy way. So, you know, at the end of the day, if the news is still bad, you can still sing to it. You got that. That was the idea. You know, we thought we'd try and put on a party and raise a couple of issues to see if being happy was enough to save the world. And if not, then at least we'd have a good dance right before we went. A scapocalypso was the theme of it. <laughs> uh, and I think it was driven by the reggae records we loved because they were terribly happy records. And at the same time, they'd clearly come from situations of quite social deprivation. And so there was a nobility in them, a, a, a pride in life, even though life was hard. Uh, and, uh, and that was an element that we wanted to try and combine with our our sense of urban angst, the sort of velvet underground industrial noise feeling that you often got in Birmingham, like Detroit, uh, and also the escapism of the perfect three-minute pop single, which could be anything from what we call Tamla Motown in England, uh, or any of the great 60s singles, Dusty Springfield, all the way through to the Buzzcocks, which made it in two minutes, 20 seconds, and you had to play the record again the whole way through. You hadn't had enough yet. <laughs> Double it. And Double. That, that was our idea, really, of trying to approach the situation. Somebody had commented that they wanted it to come across like the monkeys, but John Lennon was writing the lyrics backstage. Huh. That's really interesting. Yeah. Mm. That's, well, it's, um, it, you know, it's interesting that you, you'd brought up, of course, reggae and, and Motown too, because considering... At the time, not everybody had access to great national or world, you know, international records. That's what I was saying. International sounds. Yes. A band like you and so many others in, in, in similar ways, whether we're talking about the Clash or whoever, you were the gateway to people even learning that reggae existed. Yes, a lot of people told us that. Uh and it came about through the most odd of circumstances. There was only one radio station for England, Radio 1, BBC, Radio 1. That's it. If you wanted pop music, they tried a couple of ships off the coast, you know, and <laughs> it sounded like you were underwater, but you listened anyway. But really, for most people, there was Radio 1. And there was one television show, Ready, Steady, Go, that in the late 60s, early 70s, turned into Top of the Pops. And that was it, one show. So anything that was in the top 20 was played on Radio 1. And the artists that were in the top 20 or top 10 appeared on Top of the Pops. So we grew up excitedly watching the Four Tops, followed by the Kinks, followed by Diana Ross and the Supremes, followed by the Rolling Stones. And we didn't know there was anything odd about that at all. It seemed completely normal to us because those were the songs that were in the charts. Those were the songs that England loved at the time. And uh, it wasn't until we came to America and we realised that music had been separated along certain lines, you know. Uh, a young fan came at a, an early show. We played Tears of a Clown in the set. And she said, do you know somebody's already covered your song, but it's really slow. You can't dance to it at all. And it was the first time that she'd heard Smokey Robinson. She was 19 or 20, lived in Kansas. Um, so we didn't realise there was that separation. Now, I'm sure they didn't do it on purpose in England. They did it for cost cutting. <laughs> we'll just stick them all on the same bloody station. It's all nonsense. Yes, right. Uh, <laughs> but, but in a way, it trained a whole generation uh, and gave us a terrific education in it. So the same thing happened all the way through growing up with the American R&B acts and the English pop acts and the American pop acts. Mm -hmm. uh, there was never there was never a perception that there was any difference in anything going on. And so we grew up believing there wasn't, which is great because there isn't. <laughs> right. No, I agree on that. And I think it's come back around to that again with a lot yes. of the way that we, um, you know, most people, now there's most access, people listen like that, that anyway, but especially the younger generation. That's how they picked up. Yeah. On it. Now, if you're a musician, generation you've got, have got such access to stuff yeah. now. It's remarkable. Though. Yeah, you have, they have all the music in the world all the time. 
I'd have never left the house at 14 if that had been an option, probably. Hang on, I'm just listening to some high life. Wait a second. I've just found this great new group from the Gabon. <laughs> so, so with that in mind, you know, so you all do the records and ska happens. Ska becomes yeah. the real thing that we're in. Did you ever then feel boxed in by that? People's perceptions of you're a ska artist? Because obviously you... Well, were a little bit. I mean... Uh... You could have somebody tell you that Save It For Later or I Confess is their favourite Scar song ever. And you feel ambiguous at least, you know, uh, neither of them are Scar right. and neither of them are the best Scar song ever either. But, uh, but you take what compliments come your way. Uh, but it is a bit weird. It, it, got, it got used, I think, in America as a catch-all for any, any of those kind of uh, syncopated bands, that meant it was Scar, mm -hmm. uh, which is okay. You don't mind, really, I suppose, what, so long as they remember your name. <laughs> so, Fell right uh, on the marquee. That's, uh... You know, yes, it, it's, it's okay, rather than they go, the English who? No, beat. Uh, so, but, yes, uh, and I think by... Uh, the end of the first year in the beat, we were feeling the straight jacket of it a little bit, which is why this second album went a little bit wider. Uh, it was a reaction to everything having to go one, two, three, four, check, 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 faster, come on, faster, it's not fast enough, the words are still fitting, it's not fast enough. <laughs> I used to spend ages at home writing the lyrics, wandering around the room like a poet, you know, and you could say them really slowly and deliciously and get the rhythm of it. And then you'd practice the song, and each time you practiced it, it got two beats a minute faster. And in the end, you finished up, and they all sounded like the auctioneer's song to me. <laughs> You're a bit behind the beat, Dave. Try it one more time. No, the beat's way ahead of the lyric. Trust <laughs> me, I wrote it. <laughs> but there was nothing could be done. You just had to chase the drum. Yeah. Come on, it's dance music, Wakeley. Pick it up, pick it up. <laughs> Luckily, it worked out. There is a there, there is a post beat song, um, very famous. Uh, She's having a baby, which was yes. a title track to the movie. I I've known the song forever. In songs come and go in our lives, right? Yes. That one came back to me recently. Before I knew oh. that we were doing, it was. Around Christmas time into January, I bet I listened to that song 20 or 30 times in the course of a week. And why? I don't know. Just, man, did I reconnect with that one. Well, there was a, the only time it's ever happened to me. Uh, John Hughes was just about to have his first kid, and so was I. Uh, as it started and as it finished, we both had a kid. And we were discussing the differences and similarities uh, between being a couple with no kids and a couple with a kid. Uh, and the conversation ended up as a written thing with the same sheet of paper, and we sent it across the Atlantic two or three times like a postal chess game. I don't know who ended up with the letter, but I don't have it. So, <laughs> uh, But anyway, we wrote... So there's lots of different bits from the things that me and John had been discussing. Uh, one of the things that had come up was uh, difficult for, for the man to not be the most important person in everybody's life all of a sudden. Hello. Uh, you love your kids like you miss your wife. It's a, 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 a terribly tough thing for a man to have to say. Right. <laughs> and, of course, it's more to do with your inability to join the team, you know. Uh, it's easier for women to become mothers than it is for dads to become fathers, I think. It can be done, but it's more obviously intuitive, I think. Uh, or maybe that's a generational thing, you know. <laughs> At least we were allowed in the room when the baby was being born. Right, right. <laughs> My dad had to stoically chain smoke plain cigarettes for four hours, walking <laughs> up and down. That was tradition. So, uh, uh, small steps, I suppose. But, it, but that, I think that gave the song, and I've heard it a few times recently, and I think that gave the song some extra resonance because it was 
two confused young fathers <laughs> talking about the changes in their life. All change. She's having a baby. <laughs> it came from somewhere real. I mean, that's that's always yes, that's right. right. So what you know it came from a real conversation. So mm -hmm. I think it carried uh, that weight of that. Now, the initial idea of the song, in my mind, was more Rolling Stones, uh, and as they. And he was quite happy with that. John Hughes was quite happy with that. It was kind of uh, the rap shackle rolling stone. That's a greasy rock and roll uh, rolling stones. And I thought it sounded great like that. And uh, then they did some testing, marketing on the movie and were shocked to find that it was appealing, at, if at all, to a much older demograph than all of John Hughes's previous films, which had been 20s and down, and it was now 26 and up or something. They were all in shock. And so they quickly decided that the Rolling Stones was not the right way to go. Boy George was the way to go. And so they, they drafted in one of Boy George's producers, and we Boy George'd it up basically, yeah. which is another yeah. artist that I like. And as they were paying, I was quite happy to hear a Rolling Stones version and a Boy George version. I'd have done a Neil Diamond just to check, but they, no, <laughs> they were happy with the Boy George version. And, uh, and that was what came out. You can do that now with mastering, you know, that's, uh, we could, we could hear the, uh... master that. yeah, make that sound <laughs> a bit more like the Rolling Stones. Could you? <laughs> And, and it was funny because the version, the demo I'd done, the Rolling Stones version, went on and on and on and on into the night. And the, we finally mixed it up 4 a.m. And the only uh, only criticism we got was, well, it sounds ramshack. It sounds like it was done in the middle of the bloody night. I'm like, ha-ha, got it. You got it. <laughs> nailed it. Work, yeah, nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hearing that. I do. Well, fast forward, you know, we get a bit more to the present. And, you know, you, you, of course, you did that record last time we talked was the, the most recent record you guys put out. Yeah. Which has now been, I want to say, what, seven years or so? Six, I think. But, yeah, probably like that. Six or seven years. Yeah, yeah. But how time flies. And, and I've got song for a new record in my head. I've had them growing over these last few years. But I'm reticent. I'm reticent and I'm playing a game with myself at the moment. I'm pretending that these songs are only for me. I've whored myself out quite enough. Oh, I've got a new tune, everybody. Come and tell me how good it is. No, nobody's going to get to hear them except Muggins here. That's my personal select. And i got to tell you, they're 12 of the best songs I've ever written, especially before I record them. They we'll have to believe you on that. The yeah. orchestra in my head has got it nailed. Um, it was a labour of love making the last record. I was terribly lucky because there was a studio that was willing to kind of sponsor me with time by paying the staff fees for them, but not having to pay the whole rental. Otherwise, it would have been prohibitively expensive. And even with the reduced cost that I luckily managed, it about broke even. It sold to the closest of fans. But there was a heartbreaking part of it where even if it was on sale with the older records at the gigs, people who buy the old one and have me sign that, they've got enough songs from me. Now, maybe I could generate new fans that would like new songs as part of their tapestry. But once the people have got a collection of songs of yours from 45 years ago, and they love them, they know the words. You can see their faces drop if the second time in the set you go, here's another new one. And they go, oh, really? God, just had a piss. All right, well, I'll go and get a drink. Are they going to do save it for later? You know, it's heartbreaking. <laughs> because Chris, you could be Neil well, Young, yeah, right. you know, and, and, and you know, you're going you're gonna to deal with what I give you. Because, you know, it's I for know, me so, up yeah. here right now. Well, somebody had a lovely joke on Twitter about that, didn't they? They had it, Neil Young, it's only love can break your heart. And this guy wrote, just paying $1,300 to watch you sing, it's pretty heartbreaking too, Neil. <laughs> oh, ticket prices, that's another, that's a, that's a whole conversation. <laughs> I don't here. understand them. Uh, I sometimes feel left out 
but I don't I don't know how they get away with it. I don't know how their fans don't feel aggrieved, really. But yeah. I've always been the other way. I've kept ticket prices low. Uh, it, I think it started in the recession in 2008, around that time. Certain people, in order to stay on the road, were putting the prices of everything up. Clubs were putting ticket prices up. Some clubs were putting the price of beer up as people have got less and less money. And I think the people who did that, they a lot of them went out of business. They they pushed it too hard. So I decided to go the other way and drop the ticket price and drop the merchandise price a bit. And people seemed to like that more. And so we did terrific business through the recessions and, and it's carried on since then. But uh, we've never really gouged... Uh, and I see the price of tickets, and I'm like, well, nobody's going to buy that. Oh, it's sold out. I'm like, oh. But for how long? I mean, luckily, there are people like you, like Robert Smith, you know, who who went out there and took charge and said, absolutely yeah. not. And I, I really think it's going to have to be the government getting involved because it feels, it, I mean, I, I don't mean this in a cliche term. It feels criminal. It feels actual it does doesn't criminal. it you know and you never like that when it's something around something that you think is kind of sacrosanct mm -hmm. not necessarily holy or religious in that sense but there's something about music that it should be messed with in in that sort of way we know there's corruption all around but it, it does seem a shame it's particularly concerts because um it's where people develop mass consciousness and then that, and they take it home with them and, it, and it, a great concert can cheer up a whole city for weeks without anybody even knowing it. Uh, so I think it's very important for that. And so it's a shame to see it. But I think it's because artists and concerts have become so important to people, they've now made themselves vulnerable to being gouged. Mm -hmm. You know, is it going to be the last time you see Neil Young? You know, right. that might be the last time I do it. If I think I'm on my way out. It's like, yeah, $1,000 ticket, I'll play whatever you want. Two hours, just scream at me until I play it, and then I'll go okay. on. I'll get to oh, it. Oh, they're good concert, I think. <laughs> uh, I'll quickly mention, too, uh, we'll see you on tour this year, of course, but, uh, you know, you're going to do some shows with Vampire Weekend. Well, that is stunning, isn't it? Yes, yeah, the, Hollywood Bowl, the Hollywood Bowl. The Hollywood Bowl, a great honour to play there. Um, although... To be honest, to start with, I wasn't sure because my memory's not great. People would say, you played there before, Dave. I'm like, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm waiting for somebody to tell me. But it turns out I hadn't. And it is a great honour. And even more exciting for me was that we already had things like the Greek theatre with Adam and the Ants, uh, the uh, Cruel World Festival in Pasadena, all sorts of big shows that really should have prevented us from being able to accept the show and how lovely of them every one of them said i'm not going to stand in the way of dave getting a chance to play the ball oh, that's cool. now we had to readjust some of the fees just in case anybody loses any ticket sales but the way the tickets are going it looks as though they won't be docking me anything and we'll get to pay them i'm told it was direct from the band we'd been an influence and that they do this quite regularly, supposedly, when they're booking shows. Oh, well, that would be fun. Let's have them. We used to like them when we were kids. And so uh, I, I think the two bands will sound fantastic together as well. Right. You know, the, um, there is something about syncopation. It lifts the heart. I don't know why it does, but it does. Uh, Another th reason why we can go down great in broad daylight in a festival. We can start at one o'clock or two o'clock and we can get the whole crowd dancing. Whereas other groups, they really need that night time and the lights and the drama to build up and then the crowd goes off. But I think it's down to syncopation rather, rather than the songwriting. I'd like to say it was the songwriting. I'll make them dance in the sunshine and watch. Um, but I think it's syncopation. It, people, even without noticing, suddenly start moving in time with it. It's sort of irresistible. Yeah, and that well, was the idea, try and get everybody dancing. And when you're dancing, your mind feels more open. And then try and hit them with lyrics that suggested 
other ways of looking at things. Not too soapboxy, because my shoes don't fit you and my views don't fit you in the same way, but we both probably got feet, you know, right. most of us. Uh, and, and so you have to try and find a way, you know, you're on a stage, not a soapbox. You've got opinions, but you can't expect everybody to share them. But you're allowed to share yours passionately mm -hmm. and, and take the blows as they might come, you know. Um, syncopated music seemed to be the perfect uh, vehicle for that. I saw David Bowie on an interview a couple of days ago, a couple of weeks ago, sorry, and asking him about music, and it stunned me because I'd never heard anybody say what I'd felt. And he said, oh, well, you know, I'm only really interested in music as a vehicle for my ideas and my lyrics. And I was like, exactly. And it's like, <laughs> what instrument would be there? I don't know, marimba. That'd hear him up, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Just a vehicle. So that was it for me, really. The, the music I hear in my head is to try and set up the situation so that the lyrics can be delivered most effectively, the most connectedly, passionately and compassionately and then see if anybody will buy the new bloody record anyway slaved away for months should this be a comma or a semicolon does it matter yeah <laughs> i can say i enjoyed that record as i've enjoyed all the records that you're doing and i really do it mean got that. splendid reviews and i mean yeah. it did sell some records but it didn't sell like Sure. You'd hope to reach And, and like. neither are the Stones, by the way. Uh, the, you know, their new right. record isn't selling like their old records either. Um, People have got goes. so much choice at the moment, isn't it? And particularly, you can just buy tracks. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you don't have to I buy them. I was always a singles stream. person myself, really. Yeah. I, I, I was a singles person. I used to like the record player, big pile of singles on it, and they'd drop. Mm -hmm. And you'd hope they'd drop at one at a time. Right. And with a bit of luck, the needle would actually get up. <laughs> oh, God, you got to get up again. <laughs> I used to like that. Uh, it took me a little while to get used to albums. But then a local group, Led Zeppelin, turned everybody's heads around. No singles, they said. Mm -hmm. Singles are corny. And I suppose you couldn't get one eight and a half minutes long. <laughs> so <laughs> couldn't cut it onto a disc smart the right size so all of a sudden we were for a few years there no singles mm -hmm. from quite a lot of groups but i always used to enjoy them and uh, i had thought about re-release uh, so releasing some of these new songs and just bringing them out a song at a time mm -hmm. or two songs at a time uh, rather than laboring away uh, with an album and ideas and a sleeve by the time it comes out it's a year old anyway oh, that was a good joke a year ago that wasn't it <laughs> for everybody else overdid it so uh i might do that we'll see but although i'm still terribly tempted to just be spiteful and keep them to myself <laughs> say something really gorgeous about that. <laughs> well i will I'll you'll, have to, you'll have to torture me on my deathbed to hear the last album come on Wesley, you're not getting out of here what's track three <laughs> I will say I, I will wrap up by saying this. I will selfishly hope one way or the other we get to hear those, even just like whatever it is, because all right, then you've convinced me, you've twisted me up <laughs> by me, popular me. demand. He's back. <laughs> <laughs> well, take it. Uh, in the meantime, uh, what happened about on Record Store Day again? Everybody can get just can't stop already right now. Dave, yeah. it is such a pleasure to talk to you again. Thank you so much for taking the time. Lovely. A real pleasure. Plen was right. Sterling character. Lovely chap. And beef addict as well. I, I raise my cup of uh -huh. Masters, Barry's Master Blend. And thanks to my guest. Also, thanks to you. For, uh, for checking out the episode in the series. Before you get out of here, hit that subscribe button. Again, uh, you get three brand new interviews every single week. New and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at uh, right here on YouTube or, of course, anywhere in podcast land, including iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podchaser, NPR, or WFPK.org as well. A great way to keep up with your favorite artists and discover new ones as well. Then after that, actually head over to WFPK.org. That's where I do a show, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern. It's an hour full of song premieres, music news, anniversary spins, bonus interviews, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern at WFPK.org. 
Consequence has your music and film news. You can also find me on the social media spots, uh, Facebook, Instagram, mostly on Twitter. All three of them, the address is at Kyle Meredith. Do hope you like and follow along. That does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time.